John chapter number 8. Don't have time to read all the verses that I'm wondering. So we're going to start reading in verse number 31. The Bible says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then, verse number 36, he said, And if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, in this passage, get a little bit of backstory, a little bit of context. Jesus went up into the Mount of Olives, verse number one. Verse number two, you're going to find him in the synagogue early in the morning, and he's teaching. And as he's teaching, the Pharisees, which were also there, began asking him questions, denying who he is, denying what he said, and trying to claim that he didn't know what he was talking about. Okay, Jesus, great way, cleared all that up. In fact, in verse number uh, 30, before we started reading, it says, And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Jesus clears up a whole bunch. But to boil down what Jesus said, he said, he said many things unto them, but all of them were true. And then they said, well, you're your own witness. There's no proof of what you're saying. And he said, well, the law says you've got to have two witnesses. I bear witness of myself, and my father bear witness of me. Because everything that I've told you, I heard of him. And then the Bible says that they did not discern that they were talking that he was talking about Jehovah God, the Heavenly Father. Right? They thought that he was talking to his earthly father. Okay? But really, if you want proof of everything that Jesus said, God wrote it down all back here in the Old Testament. God foretold that he'd come, he foretold what he'd say, and how he'd live where he'd be born. Everything that they needed to believe that he was Jesus was there. They just didn't want to see it. And then after what we read, you know, verse number 33, and they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. Because he said, The truth shall make you free. They said, We never were in bondage. Well, they must be forgetting about Egypt and Babylon and Assyria. And even at this point, they're not truly free. They're under Roman rule. But what they're saying is, we are Abraham. See, we were not, you know, brought under the wishes of another. Every time Israel did something, is because they messed up. Right? Every time something bad happened to them, it's because God was chasing them, trying to return them back to Him. What they're saying, and nobody makes us do anything. We're Abraham seed. They start pounding on. Jesus. He says, if you were Abraham seed, you would live as Abraham did. And then they start throwing a few more jabs at him. Basically, it boils down to verse number, I think it was, yep, verse number 33. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. In other words, he says, you'll know a tiger by its stripes, leopard by its spots, right, a duck by its quack. They say, those that sin are the servants of sin. Those that are of Abraham's seed would have lived as Abraham lived. And in fact, Jesus goes on, really, not being mean in any of this. He's not being chastised. He's just telling them the truth. Just like he said, he told them before. He says, everything I've told you is the truth. Truth is meant to set you free. Then he says, in hillbilly slang, what he said was, tell me if you think Abraham would have done what you're doing right now. Right? He says, I've told you everything that my father's told you everything that I've said has been true right? the things that have yet to come they will be true in fact he t talks in these verses about how they'll crucify him and he says everything's going to be true everything that I've already done is true everything that you've seen me do I mean we can go back to the past couple of chapters he's got multitudes following him because they've seen him heal many of diseases right sermon on the mound has already happened Multitude there. Woman at the well, John chapter number 4, he goes and he meets one lady, and by the end of it, there's a multitude that comes out of the city to come and see him. Everything that he's done has been of many witnesses. And he says, Abraham wouldn't have doubted like you guys are doubting. So why do you doubt? And it all boils down to, they were the servants of their 
father, he goes on to tell them that your father is the devil. Right? Well, that's the backstory. So in verse number 31, okay, many believed on him in verse 30. Hallelujah. Right? Many can still believe on him to this day. But those that believed on him, he said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. In other words, he's encouraging them that, hey, you've done the right thing in believing, but as James would say, I will prove my faith by my works. Right? Live what you've put your faith in, is what he's telling them. Right? We don't work for salvation, but because of salvation, I do different works. That's that new creature. He says, proof's in the pudding. I live different, I act different, I walk different, because I am different. And that gets into verse number 32. And ye shall know the truth. He says, if you continue in my word, what is his word? The truth. He says, continue in my word, you'll know the truth. He said, you won't be deceived. Your eyes will be open. As a songwriter once said, I once was blind, but now I see. I know the truth. But then, he says, and the truth shall make you free. He says, continue in my words continue on what I've taught and how I've instructed you and even though it hadn't been written yet he's talking about them epistles that eventually apostles would pen that show how Christ wanted the church to be how it's modeled after his relationship or how his relationship with the church is modeled after the home essentially right? how we're the body, he's the head how we're all supposed to be fitly framed together. We're supposed to be of one mind and one accord. That we should have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. He says, continue in that word and you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Then in verse number 36, he says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Those two things don't contradict each, each other. First he says the truth shall make you free. Then he says, the Son shall make you free. Well, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and the Word was with God. Jesus was the Word. He says, continue in my Word. He was the Word made flesh. He was truth in flesh. Holiness, righteousness. The divine being of God. God is truth. Why do you think that the Bible so many times says that those that seek Him will find wisdom or truth or understanding? Because left to our own devices and our carnal senses, we can come up with a whole bunch of theories. There have been a whole lot of people throughout history come up with a whole bunch of stuff. But the truth comes from the one that made us. Right? There are those that have gleaned miraculous things that God's done. I mean, you can go over to the Creation Museum. You can sit down in that big... Uh, not in astronomy, but that's what I'm looking for. Planetarium. Astronomy is the study of planets in space. But you can sit down in the planetarium and you can just start to glimpse how many galaxies and stars and stars and everything else that God flung out. And then you start remembering verses like He calls them all by name. That by Him and through Him do all things consist. And by looking at the work of God, what He's made, we can glean a little bit about how big God really is. But then again, not even scratching the surface. He said that He is old, you know, from old to everlasting. Right, try and wrap your head around that one. Right or how He walked out on nothing and said, let there be light, and then boom, it happened. And really, go ask somebody who thinks that the light comes from the sun, and, you know, may blow their mind. That he made light before he made the sun. I'm just being honest. That's truth. We can see the evidence of truth in what God made or God works with man. What God's done, which is why he recorded it for us so that we could go back and through the Holy Ghost because the word is spiritually discerned. He can enlighten upon us that yeah, it really did happen. It really is true. 
Right? Truth comes from God. He was truth. So the truth, the Son, make you free. You're free. But see, I've often heard verse number 36 especially, but also verse number 32, misquoted. Where they'll say, if the Son set you free, you are free indeed. That's not what this says. Not what God wrote down. What did God say? Make you free. Big difference there. To set something free means it once was free, but now it's ensnared. To make something free, it was never free to begin with. If you set something free, you are returning something to its previous state. But to make something free, you're giving it a whole new life. If you make something free, all it has ever known is bondage. To set someone free, they knew what it was to be free, now they're not free. Okay, just follow with me here for a second. Okay. Today, I'm not in jail. I have no intentions on going to jail. My knowledge, I haven't done nothing that deserves for me to go to jail. Okay, let's just clear that up. But if tomorrow, outside of the grace of God, I decide I'm doing 120 down US 42, there's a good chance I'm going to get pulled over and I'm going to go to jail because that's felony reckless driving. Yeah, that's, that's a big no-no. Anything 20 miles an hour over the speed limit is considered a felony. But anyway, especially on 42 where the speed limit's 40 miles an hour. Point being, I could end up in prison. Now, the judge could choose in that situation to set me free with time served or a bail or, and then a fine and community service and a whole bunch of other stuff. But I was free and then did something that caused me to become captive. I could be set free, returned to freedom. Okay, now, to make free, let's use America's not-so-always-pleasant past, if someone was born into slavery in the United States back when slavery was legal, they were a slave. If your parents were slaves and they had a child from the day that you took your first breath, you were a slave. They were not free. They belonged to someone or to something. Now, let's just clear that up. Not a big fan. Okay? Slavery wrong. Just want to clear that up. Case anybody on the interwebs wants to say that I was up here advocating, say, not true. Okay? But that person did not know what freedom was. And it wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation that did it. That was just a piece of paper with somebody's signature on it. Took an amendment to the Constitution. That's why if you're ever watching Jeopardy and they say what, you know, act freed the slaves, not the Emancipation Proclamation. It was the amendment to the United States Constitution. But when that amendment was passed by Congress those slaves were made free. They were not set free. They were given freedom for the first time. They were made free individuals. They did not know what freedom... They desired it. They hungered for it. Many of them prayed and sang, you know, praise unto God, took inspiration from Israel and Egypt, believing that if they put faith in God to free them, that God would work it out. So, those that knew not freedom were made free for the first time. That's the difference that we're talking about here. Because when you misquote verse number 36 or verse number 32, what you're saying is, if the Son set you free, I was free, but I got myself into some trouble and Jesus came along and then put me back the way that I was. If Jesus would have left me the way that I originally came in, I'd still be on my way to hell. I don't want him to set me free. I needed him to make me free. Now, of course, Jesus, in these verses, talking about truth shall make you free and the Son shall make you free. He's referring to, first, of course, sin. We all were born into sin. We were not free. 
Our fate had already been decided because we were conceived in sin, born in sin, sinners by trade, sinners by choice. Right? Our fate had already been determined because we were not what God's standard was. What was that? Jesus. We did not meet up to the expectations of the truth, the Word. So when Christ says that the truth shall make you free, right? what He was saying is the Pharisees in the way that they you know, dressed, the way that they kept all their set of rules, their legalism, you know, their lording over the house of God and turning what was perfect into something corruptible. He's saying, that's not going to make you free. In fact, the Apostle Paul later talks about that under the law, we're in bondage to the law. All the law can make you is a sinner. Show you that you have need of a Savior. The law cannot save you. It cannot make you free. It can only show you that you are in bondage. It shows us how you know, rotten, filthy sinners we really are. But praise be God, the truth can make someone free. The Son can make someone free. He says everything that you were can be forgotten. Right? Once you're free... You're free. If the Son make you free, you're free indeed. Nothing anyone can do about it. Right? devil can't change it. Right? God can't change it because God promised that He would make you free and God's not a liar. It's impossible for Him to lie. Christ can't change it because He said that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can't change it. Somebody else can't change it. If He make you free, you're free. Right? But then in the context of he's talking about the Pharisees, he's also talking about the Romans. In Jesus' time, there were a lot of dissidents that wished to rise up and overthrow the Roman government. They wanted to lead a charge for Israel to be free and independent. He says, you can put your hope in a man, but even if Rome gets kicked out, even if you set up your own leaders, does that really change what's going on in your life? He says, you may be able to turn your captivity from Rome, which, by the way, they tried it, and it didn't work. That's why Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. But he says, a man cannot make you free. He may be able to change your circumstances, but that doesn't make you into something different. He says, you still are the person that you are. Everything in this day and age was focused on the outward man. That's why he called the Pharisees whited sepulchers and cisterns that could hold no water. They were empty, full of dead men's bones. Right? All the rules could not change what was on the inside. Couldn't give them hope or things that would stay. It could not make them into a different person. But he says the truth can, and the Son can. And if the Son does, nothing can change it. But notice again in verse number 31, he says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? Doesn't say that the truth will make you free as a one time thing, it says, shall. That's present tense. That means continually. If he says that the truth shall, you know, if he didn't say the truth shall make you free, if he says the truth will make you free, that means you can go back into unfreedom. Will make you free is a one time thing. But shall means forevermore. Right? Thankfully. God wrote things in the perspective of God's eyes. Because man's concerned with right now. God's concerned with everything. Right? He's in all times, at all points. At, he's everywhere at every time. God sees yesterday just like He sees today and He sees tomorrow. He said, explain that. i got a hard time wrapping my head around that because I'm confined to this. All I understand is that there's a watch on my hand and that one second you're 
by the time you realize that now is the present, it's already in the past. But I've got a hard time wrapping my head around, you know, the omnipresence of God, but I believe it. And when God wrote the book, thankfully, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to... That's not a one-time thing. That's continually. God wrote it in perpetuity. Just like He wrote this verse in perpetuity. Notice the chronological order here. First they believed, in verse number 30. And then He says, continue. That means don't turn. Stay the course. Right? Be like Paul. At the end, say you fought a good fight. You finished your course. Right? Then, he says, if you continue. He says, then ye are my disciples indeed. Semicolon, which means that the thought isn't all the way over yet. In other words, he says, if you want to be associated with me and want to be one of my disciples, continue in the things that I've told you. He says, you believe that's good, but keep at it. Grow your spirituality. Okay, then, by the way, some of them did that because they were called Christians, not by themselves, but at Antioch, by people on the outside looking in saying, they live a whole, you know, bear a striking resemblance to that guy that they crucified in Jerusalem. We'll call them Christians because their life looks like his life. So some did. But he says, if you continue, then you'll be my disciples, semicolon, and. Which means there's more to it. What's the next step? He says, and ye shall know the truth. When? When you continue in his word. The truth is not like the world thinks of truth. That once you know something, it's not a fact. Okay, there's a whole bunch of useless facts that I've got up here in my head because I watched a whole lot of How It's Made and History Channel growing up and Discovery Channel. A whole bunch of stuff I'll never use, but I know it. But say, that's not truth. But that, that's just information. Truth yesterday may not be truth for you today. I'm not saying that what's true can change. What I'm saying is your situation changes. There are parts of the Word that yesterday you didn't need, but today you do need. The parts that you read yesterday when everything was sunshine and roses, that's still just as true. But it doesn't mean that that's the truth you need for today. Why do you think the psalmist said, Daily, early will I seek thee? Right, Lord, give me what I need for today. Because what you gave me yesterday was just as true, but today's a new day. Today's the day that the Lord hath made. I need something to get me through today when I get cut off in traffic and feel like running somebody off the road that I won't. Right? I need a word fitly spoken from your word that if somebody comes to me with advice, I want to know how to answer them and answer them with confidence. Right? Lord, today I may face a new temptation or a temptation that I haven't faced in a long time. Give me the strength that I need to end that temptation, wait on you so that you can make a way of escape. Truth. Yes, it's always true. But the truth of God is so vast that we're human. We're apt to forget. We're apt to slack on our duties as disciples of God. But if we're faithful to seek Him, we will find. If we ask, we will receive. He's saying continue. He knew we wouldn't be perfect. That's why He sealed us with the Holy Ghost, because He knew we couldn't hold on to our own salvation. But he says, if you continue, then you'll know the truth. Not just a couple of facts that you can rattle off. And He's not going to give you a prayer bracelet or necklace that if you count through all the beads while you're saying all these prayers, then everything will be okay. Just stick to the fact card. Here's your short list of things to do. No, he says, I want you to understand, but in order to get the truth that you need for today, you need to continue. In order to get the truth tomorrow, you've got to be faithful, just as He was faithful. And God rewards faithfulness. But then, after that, He says, and the truth shall make you free. What you don't know can't help you. 
I know that I've been made free of sin. But, uh, we'll save that here for a second. But just because He made me free from sin when I got saved doesn't mean that no more sins popped up in my life is a problem. How did we address that? Through truth. If I shun His truth and I don't address the things in my life that keep me from following after Him, what really has happened? He made me free, but I put myself back in bondage. He broke the chains that once bound me, and I'm going back and asking for Him to be put back on. He says He will make you free. Not just when you got saved, but every day. He'll loose whatever ties have bound you. What we've let creep up in our life to ensnare us. He'll make us free again. Because to make someone, again, it's permanent. Jesus intends every time we come and ask Him, Lord, can you make me free? He says, absolutely. And He treats it like it was the first time we asked Him. And He intends it to be for forever. He doesn't take any shortcuts. So if we're not free, whose fault is it? Our fault. So with the Lord's help, we're just going to teach for a few minutes on captive Christians. Captive Christians. If Jesus made you free and you're in bondage, then whose fault is it? Mine. I can't lose my salvation, but I can lose fellowship. I can lose discernment. I can lose a whole lot. I can be put back into bondage. I may be free on the inside, but it doesn't look like it on the outside. In the eyes of God, He sees His Son, but then God also knows that His Son wouldn't be associated with those folk. His Son wouldn't be caught doing that. His Son wouldn't let this fester in His life. And God knows that something needs to be addressed. Hallelujah, I'm robed in His righteousness. But if I soil that robe that He put on me, I need to get a new robe. You see, when God gave you that robe, it's a brand new one. Untainted, unsoiled. Once something's been tainted, it's always tainted. For example, if I was to take like one little tiny drop of food coloring and put it in this cup of water, you may not be able to see that it's there, but it's there. And I'm sure that there's some way that we could boil it and do a whole bunch of other stuff and add chemicals to it. But then at that point, it's not water anymore. It's water with all the other stuff in it to get rid of what was in it. In order to return to where we were, I've got to get a new garment. I can't make that on my own. I can't wash my own garments on my own. I can't break chains that I let get put on me. I mean, we've said it before, the reason that, you know, the snares of the devil, you know why it's called a snare? Because it traps you. It wasn't called a trap if it didn't trap. It'd be called the untrap. Right? That was supposed to trap something, but it didn't trap nothing, so we don't call it a trap. So, in context, that what are the things that can cause a Christian to become captive again? Well, first, there's sin. Unrepentant sin will make you a captive. The thing that the devil desires most is to take those that are in the fight and sideline them. Some people sideline themselves, but we'll get to that here in a second. But if we continue in the way that we used to live, we don't continue in His Word. We're not going to know the truth. Not because it's not available, but because we haven't applied it. You can listen to all the preaching you want to, but unless it gets past your ears and God settles it down in your heart, the preaching didn't help you. Until it is applied, it's just more words. A whole bunch of people listen to words all the time. People talk, give me advice all the time, one ear out the other. Most of the time, because it's like Jesus said, you know, hey, let me help get that little tiny splinter out of your eye. Dude, you got a two by four sticking out of your head. I don't want you anywhere near my eye. Right? They're trying to give you advice on stuff that they've got problems handling on their own. I'll just stick with what Jesus said. I may not meet the goal, but I trust that it's the truth. 
I know it's going to work. But unrepentant sin, what does it do? Well, first, if I've got unrepentant sin, I have no fellowship. But you see, the world doesn't want me because I was made into a new creature. I'm not one of them anymore. And God wants me but can't have me because I've become unclean of my own accord. And uncleanness cannot enter in to fellowship with God. The loneliest that a person will ever be is after they get saved if they fall back into a lifestyle of sin. Because they truly are alone. The Holy Ghost may call upon them and draw them, but you draw something from a distance. He draws us with cords of loving kindness because until we get clean, we can't be close with God. If we draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to us. But if I'm set in my ways, God will not approach. But at the same time, the world, we can throw ourselves into it, but just like oil and water, we'll get separated out. You can be in the middle of a room, yet still be lonely. That unrepentant sin will cause you to be separated, not just from the world, but also separated from God. That's a captivity. First off, the chains of sin are back on you. They're not going to drag you to hell, but they'll keep you from living a better life. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. You're not going to be abundant. In fact, you'll barely be doing what's called a living. You're miserable all the time. Bondage. That unrepentant sin spits in the face of God and tramples the blood of Christ under our feet and says, thanks for eternity, but I'll live now the way that I want to live. No, we were bought with a price. Our life is no longer our own. We should desire to honor and glory the one that did for us what we could not do for ourselves. But if you're not continuing in His Word, that Word doesn't sink in down in here. Oh, you hear it, but it never hits home, truly. Not because we have not continued in His Word. And in the last days there would be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. You can listen or you can hear. You can endure or you can apply. To continue in His Word means to reject man's logic. To reject that sometimes doing the right thing doesn't always feel the best. But the mentality of the world is, if it feels good, do it. Sometimes it may be hard making a stand, but I'd rather honor Him. Where do those desires come from? Where do you think that they burst forth in our life? Well, first it's the seed of Himself that He planted in us. But it's the Word that reassures us that I do desire Him over the world. It's in here that I find out how lovely, how beautiful how sincere, how gracious and how merciful He is. You get away from the Word of God, you'll believe anything. If we neglect to continue in His Word outside the grace of God, we could end up being one, living one of the most wicked lifestyles in the world. But there have been many people that have come through the front doors of the Emmanuel Baptist Church that when you'd have seen them, you'd have thought, there's no way that that person's saved. Right, in the flesh. You just think, man, that guy looks rough. Come to find out, it's just somebody got cold on God. Little by little, they didn't continue in the Word. But when you find out that God dunked them and gave a new robe again, right, cleaned them, they come in, you think it's a completely different person. They talk different. They act different. Why? Right, because God's given them back to that desire, the joy of being made free. They can make you free again. But why did we go back in a cat? Because of unrepentant sin. Things that we're not sorry for. Things that we think we can handle. Let's just be honest. Church of Laodicea, they weren't cold or hot. They were trying to live both lifestyles at the same time. What did God say? He said it made him sick. He spewed them out of his mouth. He said, I can't do anything with you because you're not cold enough to realize that you need to get warm. 
And if you were warm, I could just throw more wood on the fire, keep you all burning. But he says, until you come to your own senses, until you get miserable enough to return to the Word and continue in what He said, God won't force Himself upon you, just like He didn't force you to get saved. Unrepentant, that's pride. Pride in itself is a sin. But what keeps us from repenting of all the other sins that we've got? Pride. We don't want to admit that we were wrong. We don't want to come and confess to the Lord. I was prideful. Let's be honest. Anybody in here, when you mess up, you know you messed up. The last thing you want is somebody to come by, start ragging on you about how you messed up. I know I messed up. That's why I stopped doing it that way, and I've got it back to where it should be. Right? I learned the lesson, you don't need to rub my nose in it. God's not that way. We know that we're wrong, but we just got to wait until we're miserable enough or until we get enough common sense to realize, why did I ever leave the Father's house? How did I end up here? It was just one step at a time, but those steps add up. And whether you realize it or not, the chains may have, may have been pretty loose at the beginning, but you still had shackles on your wrist. But no, I can, I can still move around. I can get to everything that I need. But the further we go out, the tighter they get. The less we can move, the stronger a grip it gets on us. Sometimes the reason that Christians are captive is because they've got unrepent. They won't say, "Lord, I was wrong. Repent of it, and then get it taken care of." A whole bunch of people come and cry crocodile tears, but do they really turn from what they were doing, or are they just sorry that they got caught? Are they sorry about the price that they had to pay, rather than? the thing that they actually did? We do reap what we sow. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. That's the way that He intended it to be. Whatever you put in the ground is coming up out of the ground. And the thing about seeds is, you put one seed in, you get a whole bunch of fruit. You may have thought, well, if I'd put one seed in and two seeds come out, that's nah, not always a guarantee. One seed may go in and a whole bunch may come out. There's a bondage, an unrepentant sin. But then, there's also bondage in a completely different category. Right? Unaddressed iniquity. Was that unequal dealing with God? Different sin sends the infraction of God's law. In the way that Christ said, continue in my work. We're not continuing after God. We've done something different. We've gone against the commandments. But iniquity, unequal dealing with God. Lord, I didn't kill anybody this week. Good. Shouldn't be that hard. All right, for a Christian to say, I don't feel like killing somebody today. Shouldn't even be a thought in our mind. But, but there are things, may not be sin. Well, what did he say? He said, commanded us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul all our mind iniquity is when we let something take precedent over God in our life or we've shortchanged God and given him less than our best he gave his best he expects our best I don't know what your best is but you know what your best is and God knows what your best is but when we begin to just drift a little bit I mean it's why we need revival there are people that love God, they just don't love Him the most in their life. But if I regard iniquity in my heart, He won't even hear my prayers. Why? Because I have not given Him due place in my life. There's a bondage in iniquity. You come where you know you're supposed to be three times a week, but you don't get any help. Why? Because you don't want to hear what's being preached. You know that you haven't given God your best, but you're hoping that the preacher will preach on something else. I've got news for you. doesn't matter what he's preaching. If that's what you need, that's what the Holy Ghost is going to let you hear. It's going to show up in every message until you get it made right. Or until God, you know, if it gets so bad, that it turns some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. Right? There's a bondage in it. Why? Because everywhere you go, 
again, causes separation from God. But you're still trying to live the life that God instructed you to live, but on your own terms. That's a hard life. Because I can't meet up to God's standards. There are some people that want to impress God with everything that they do, but they just don't want to give Him priority. Well, Lord, I did this, 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 and this. But was he the first thing that you thought of in the morning? Was he the last thing that you thought of at night? Because you're always on God's mind. Did you commit to prayer? I'm not the kind of guy who says you got to pray so many times. Pray until you get business done with God. But do you honestly know that you gave God less time than you should have in prayer? Or in study? Or in meditating upon the things of God? Do you strive to have that pray without ceasing mindset where there's always communication between you and God? Because if you don't, that's iniquity. It's unequal because He treated us preferred above everyone else. Preferred above even His own Son. So should He not be preferred in our life? When we do come to the house of God, we may start off with the desire, Lord, I'm here to worship but did we get distracted? Were we plugged in, but then either a thought came into our mind or something that the preacher said, we buffeted at it? We bucked and said, well, mm, why'd you have to preach on that today? Chances are, it probably wasn't in his notes. But if it was, it was in the notes because God told him to put it there because God knew you needed it. But when I say, well, Lord, we don't have to do that. We can get it done this way. It's not about which way we prefer. It's about the way that He prefers. The servant does not get to dictate to the master the way the things get done around the house. Sometimes they'll just say, go get some water. And if we know where more than one well is and we know where the good water is and the bad water is, why wouldn't we go get the good water? But I'm just tired and that well's a little bit farther. But it's good water. That one's got bad water. If I get the bad water, I'm going to have to go back and then go get the good water again and bring it back. But we convince ourselves that certain things are just okay with God. Well, if He didn't say it was okay with Him, why would we expect it to be okay with Him? But all that while, we're trying to live to the standard of God because we think, well, as long as we do this, we'll be okay. If that were true, Christ wouldn't have had to die on a cross. If that were true, we could have saved ourselves. I can't live up to the expectation. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. He's got the load. He just asked us to walk with Him as He's pulling it. His yoke is easy and His burden is light because He's the one that's hooked up to it and pulling it with us. The thing about iniquity is it deprives us of all the blessings that God intended us to have and we're trying to pull the load of our life and our problems and our sin and everything about it and we're not going anywhere. We're in bondage to this false identity that we could be in our own eyes. Well, I can still get everything done that I need for God and be able to do this and this and this and this. Well, maybe... There's just a little bit of iniquity, and I've lost some of that desire for the things of God. Because used to, I didn't desire to do that, 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 and that. I just wanted to be about His business. So what happened? I'm in bondage to some things. But then, finally, sometimes people can get in bondage to just an unrelentless world. It never stops. Always a new problem. But maybe another storm coming this way. God may move it, God may not. But instead of looking at where I'm at, He said, continue in my work. That's a now thing. I can't affect yesterday and I can't affect tomorrow, but I can choose whether or not today I'm continuing. He started me on the path. All I got to do is just keep following. That's a today choice. But sometimes I look on the horizon, but Lord, what about that? That's a tomorrow problem. A today problem 
is what's under my feet right now. Why do you think he said that the word was a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path? What can we see? Well, he's shining a big bright light from heaven. That's where I'm going. But a lamp unto my feet and a light to the path, that doesn't mean I can see everything down the path. That means I can see right where I'm at and right where I'm headed. And that's it. What's the rest of it? Faith. And oh, by the way, anything that's not of faith is sin. So that links back into category number one. But some people just get so fed up with everything that could be, everything that might be. Well, Lord, what about this? What about that? Life puts them in bondage to where they're too afraid to do anything. Or they're afraid that if they don't do something right now, that it's going to be worse. They let other people's problems unnecessarily burden them down. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens, but nowhere in there does it say that I'm supposed to take your burden and make it mine. You're supposed to bear your burden. If I can help, I will. But I'm not taking it and making it mine because God gave that to you. Right? There are some burdens that God never wanted us to pick up in the first place, but yet we carry it around with us. There are some things that we let affect us that in truth, God already has the answer for why it shouldn't affect us. But yet it gnaws away at us. People start getting ulcers. Get all worked up, nervous wreck, or they're stressed out so much. Maybe that's why my hair's going gray so early. But all of it boils down to they get to the point where whatever they do, it's not because they're thinking it out and they're saying, Lord, I'll take this action out of faith because I believe it's what you want me to do because I've been continuing in your word. Everything else gets their eyes off of the word and they do either out of fear, out of instinct, which my instincts are sinful. Right? My best suggestion on my best day is not going to be anything compared to what God had in mind for it. But it's either out of fear, out of instinct, or some people just don't do anything out of apathy. They're sensory overload, and they get to the point that I can't care about all this stuff. God never intended you to care about all that stuff. He said, cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. He said, make that my burden so that you can only worry about the things that you have control over. In order to continue, I have to make progress. Some people are just caught in bondage, standing still because they don't know what to do. They don't know what God's going to do and they're not going to do anything until God makes a, you know force that plan for him to follow just follow him it doesn't always look like it's going to work out but I promise you he'll make it work out just because it didn't work out to my expectations doesn't mean that God didn't get honor and glory out of it just because God's intended do it this way you can be in the perfect will of God and do everything that you're supposed to do but if somebody else doesn't God's intended outcome may not come about but God will take care of you through it. He's not going to let you suffer for faithfulness. But if somebody else didn't do what God wanted them to do, the, God's plan may not come to fruition, but He'll take care of you. I guarantee you, you're going to be far better off in the perfect will of God than you would be if you would have gone about it your way. But some people act when they shouldn't. Some people speak when they should listen. Some people are out looking for everybody else's advice except for God's because they've got so many problems that they just want to hear every bit of information before they can boil it down. And people are a nervous wreck and those people don't get sleep. You know who does get sleep? Those that wait upon the Lord. Do you know who don't get tired? Those that wait upon the Lord. Because those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Those whose mind are stayed on God are at perfect peace. If I'm busy about the Father's business, He'll take care of everything too big for me. That's why He said, let me be the Master. I know what you can handle, and I'll take care of the rest. Servant doesn't worry about the house payment, doesn't worry about the electricity. or the water. That's the Master's problem. I'm not saying don't pay your electric bill and your mortgage and everything. If God gave you the means to pay it, pay it. 
Right? What was that? That was the master making sure that you had enough to pay for what the master wanted you to have. But there are those that just don't know what to do. They feel they have to do something. What to do it puts them in bondage. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what could happen. Anything could happen. But by the grace of God, what's going to happen is what He wants to happen. I just want to make sure that I'm where He wants me to be when it does happen. They worry about things that they can't control and it gets them to the point that they're either too afraid to act or they just do the first thing that presents itself. Because, well, because it... Because it was an opportunity. God must have opened the door. God doesn't always open every door. Some of them he shuts and we try to run through. Some of them, God may not have been the one that opened that door. But when God does open the door, no man can shut it. And he makes the door clear and known to those that need to walk through it. How do we know? Continue in his word. Know the truth that you need to know and the truth shall make you free keep you from falling into bondage if we do find because we all going to mess up we all going to slip but if we feel them chains getting a little bit tight Lord I need to be made free again he says got it not a problem for the master all that said and done he's just saying continue and everything will be alright You'll be my disciples indeed. In other words, for a certainty. Because those that believe on him believe that he's enough to take care of them. Believe that he's enough to take care of their life. And that he's big enough to take care of the things that I never even realized could be a problem. But because he loved me, he took care of it long before it ever got to me. Captive Christians are miserable. They're a nervous wreck. Right, they know where they can find answers, but they don't let the answers affect them. They don't continue in the Word. They may read it, but it doesn't hit them. So continue. Let the truth seep in, and then live it, and let it shine as a light. Right, that's it. We'll take a short break. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.